When I was a kid, someone told me about a murder. It was this bizarre unsolved murder that happened in a small town in Ohio back in the late 1980s. I, if what I heard was true, that something had to come of this. That if they didn't get that person, why'd they let that go? In 1987, Homer Potts was stabbed to death in his home by an intruder demanding money. Exactly 20 months to the day later, his wife Leela was found in the same house, brutally stabbed. They may put a screwdriver through the skull of an old lady would kill anybody. So I, don't, I think everybody was scared to death. A small little town. 30 years have passed, and there's been no new information about these murders. Oh my God, a crime like that? You'd think you'd want to find out. During my investigation, I uncovered that there were more murders and that this could have been the work of a serial killer. He was just one of those people that's just there. I wish that he wasn't there, but he was there. My investigation aims to uncover evidence that a serial killer operated undetected in Ohio during the late 1980s. I'm convinced that we were living with a serial killer. From Dayton, Ohio, I'm Thrasher Banks. This is Lords of Death. In my basement, buried under boxes of old toys and old personal belongings, there's this box. I call it the Box of Horrors. In it, there's dozens of letters from a prison inmate dating back to the late 1980s scattered among old police reports and court documents about a girl that was murdered in Dayton, Ohio, my hometown. There's also these photo albums full of Polaroids depicting these men in their 20s wearing leather jackets and smoking cigarettes. I always try to forget about the box and the horrifying story within, but every few months I bring it upstairs and go through it. The person who gave me the box told me that if I dug deep enough, I could find answers about the murders of Homer and Leela Potts and that they were connected to the murder in Dayton. As I dove deeper into the contents of the box, I began uncovering a story. It started with the Potts murders, and then it involved a crime spree that stretched from Ohio to Florida where more murders may have occurred. The more dots it connected, the more apparent that it became that a serial killer went undetected in the late 1980s. The story ends with a girl getting killed in cold blood at this park I used to play at as a child. I started with the Potts murders. I wanted to know how a brutal double murder in a small town could go unsolved for 30 years. There wasn't much information online about the case. Just this blog post written by a local who was reminiscing about the murders. I began putting in information requests with different counties and gathered up as many old news articles as I could from the local library. I wanted to know how something like this could happen without the truth coming to light. February 26th of 1987, Margaret Ramage had just finished lunch at her home outside of a small town called Byesville, Ohio. Byesville is a small, somewhat culturally isolated town with a population just over 2,000. Margaret lived on a winding, rarely traveled country road dotted with fields in between the densely wooded hills of Upper Appalachia. Just as she was cleaning up after lunch, she got an unexpected phone call. She rushed to the phone and answered. It was her neighbor, Leela Potts, and she was screaming. I need help. I need help. Hurry, come down. He's stabbing both of us.
She quickly called the police before rushing on foot to the Potts residence. When she arrived, Leela was in the rear of the house, bleeding from a wound on her lower abdomen. Her husband, Homer Potts, was lying deceased in a pool of blood in the back porch area. He was 79 years old and had been stabbed four times in the chest by an attacker that Leela described as a white bearded male in his early 20s. At this point, the attacker had already fled in what was described as a blue or green Chevy Nova. The first officer on the scene was Byesville Police Chief Tim Caesar. He attempted to calm Leo down and figure out what had happened while they waited for the ambulance to arrive. Leela said she had been laying in bed when she heard a knock on the door. Homer opened it to a man demanding money. She heard them begin to argue and went to the front of the house to see what was going on. At this point, she saw Homer try to fight off the assailant with a pair of ceramic praying hands before getting stabbed in the chest. Leela's presence startled the attacker and he turned on her and stabbed her in the lower abdomen. The would-be robber then turned on Homer again and stabbed him two more times before fleeing without stealing any money. Leela said that Homer then moved through the house and out of the back door to ring a large dinner bell to alert the neighbors. After ringing the bell, Homer collapsed in the yard and Leela dragged him back inside and shut the door. Leela was taken to the hospital and treated for her stab wound. The neighbor, Margaret, who rushed to Leela's assistance, told the local newspaper that she had known the Potts her whole life and that they're just there, all alone. The investigation was led by Guernsey County Sheriff's Office under the direction of Sheriff James Peanut Carpenter. The lead investigator was Captain Arnold Van Horn. In the following days, they fielded dozens of tips, but all of them ended up being dead ends. The attacker was never identified. And then 20 months later, in the same house, Leela Potts would be found with 17 stab wounds, a screwdriver protruding from her temple. I can't believe some of the other, well, I guess with every, every murder, and especially some strange double murder like this, you're going to hear a lot of weird... Um, Theory. This is the blogger Tapu. Her blog remains the only source of information online about the case. I reached out so I could get her perspective on the murders. Well, certainly, I mean, I know locals there, you know, and I know this only, you know, mostly from my mother reporting it to me. Certainly no one local ever thought that there were two separate murders. I mean, everybody local and just by common sense believes that the two murders were connected and that Leela had something to do with Homer's. With any murder like this, the significant other is always the first suspect. I thought that this had to just be a rumor, but police must have thought that there was some merit to this because they administered a polygraph test on Leela in the days following the murder. That's it's always been local thought there that I've heard, is that um, Leela was somehow involved in the first murder and was, you know, wounded as to make it look real. And then her murder was somehow subsequent to that. I've never heard that it was, you know, did not involve her. But again, that's just local talk. I've never heard anything official that way. But I did run across one I'd never heard about was that they had, they had a murder victim in Franklin County. Did you run into this one? 
they thought that the this was shortly after Homer's death that they identified a Franklin County murder victim that they thought was actually the murderer and that he himself had subsequently been murdered. And Van Horn, at the time, um, was not willing to rule that out. He thought that that might have been, they were investigating this and thought that it was, he was a possible suspect. The only thing that they did use to rule him out was that the description of his vehicle didn't match the vehicle they saw leaving Homer's murder. Tapu was right about this. I read about it in an old newspaper article, and the killer that she described didn't have a blue Chevy Nova. It does indicate, though, that law enforcement was chasing every lead they could. Okay, here's another one. Do you have an article where they've interviewed a clerk at the Duke Station in Buffalo? Do you know where the Duke Station in Buffalo is? It's right, it's like at the other end of the vocational road where they live. And now, who knows what a clerk at the Duke Station, you know, is, is going to hear. I mean, he says he hears, he hears a little bit of everything. But this is very fresh information. He heard the murderers were escaped convicts from Moundsville, West Virginia. This turned out to just be a rumor going around the county at the time. It never held any merit in the investigation. I asked Tapu if the blog generated any new leads in the case. The thing I did was that when I, when I started doing this, I, I, I don't even remember what my intention was. It was just that my mother got me interested in it because we lived right there on the road across from, you know, the first road that cuts off of um, vocational road where the Potts house was. Mm -hmm. And so my, and I was already, I think in college or working when all this happened, this would have been in the eighties. So yeah, I was, I no longer lived in Guernsey County, but my mom got me interested in it. So everything that I gathered, I didn't source it or anything. And I didn't write down like who told me what. I wish I could do more to help you, you know what I mean? But like I said, it, it was just, you know, right after it happened, really, and I looked it up and I wrote, you know, my blog entry a couple of years later, but I don't have any new information or, or even backup for my old information. You know, it's just a random thing that you saw my blog entry and, and it really had almost a little more to do with, like, my childhood, you know, or my teen years and my mother and me, kind of, than any... Anything I really knew about the murders. I'm so sorry not to have more for you, but I'm just not, not the person who does. I reached out to the Guernsey County Sheriff's Office to see if they would be willing to give an update about the case. I wanted to know why the murders weren't listed on the Attorney General's cold case database, and if the investigation was still active. Were any old leads followed up on? Old witnesses re-interviewed? Was there any potential DNA evidence that could crack the case? I briefly spoke with one detective, and he seemed interested in discussing the case, but he said he would have to get back with me. After that, my voicemails and emails were all ignored. I began reaching out to locals to try to find information about the murders. Several of them told me the same thing, to contact the former sheriff, Peanut Carpenter. They said he's in his early 90s now, and if I wanted answers about the Potts murders, he would be the first person to contact. tell you that. This is Peanut Carpenter. He was the sheriff at the time of the murders. He remembered the case, but his memory was a little hazy. Leela, Homer and Leela. Yeah, Potts, yeah. They were nice people. Lived alone there, down there. Very good, very nice. But see, what was funny about it, Homer died. And then later, we found Leela with a screwdriver drew in her head. You know, I can't understand 
one thing we never could understand why when Leela, when we were willing to talk to Leela, she would never tell us anything going on. She just, oh yeah, Homer died, Homer died. So I don't know if whatever happened to her blanked her out. With all the rumors that Leela may have been involved in Homer's murder, I asked Peanut if he thought that this theory had any credibility. There was a, there was a kid, actor say there was people talked about they thought they, she killed Homer. But who killed her? It was a strange thing. You know, they opened that one time. I think the other department, the other sheriff. He's referring to a cold case investigation that was launched in the early 2000s. The sheriff's department was interested in looking into the separate murders of Robin Stone, Dale Vincent, and Homer and Leela Potts. Ultimately, they weren't able to come up with anything. tell you the best guy to give the interview would be Arnold Van Horn, my, my chief deputy. Arnold would have been 100% with you because he was, he and I was very close. And uh, we were very close. Well, whatever Arnold said about it, why? Because he done by he done about all of it. Well, in fact, he did all of it. Arnold Van Horn is retired now and became somewhat of a local historian. I acquired a book he wrote titled "The History of the Guernsey County Sheriff's Department" that includes a small section about the Potts murders. I reached out and he agreed to do an interview. happened is uh, he was sitting there in his chair and knock on the door so uh, he went to the door this is, we're talking out in the country yeah that it's down by down by Byesville out in the uh, or a little town was left of a town called Trail Run which is an old mining town but anyhow he he went to the door and this guy standing there he demanding money and, of course, Homer refused to give him any money, so he stabs Homer. So then Homer went running through the house that uh, they had a, a bell on a pole out back, and he, in his mind, that he was going to uh, to ring that bell and get the neighbors, you know, get attention to somebody. And then his wife was sitting there in a chair, so she ends up getting stabbed, too. And but she didn't die. And Homer got out as far as the uh, rang the bell. And then he came back and died on the on the back step. By the time Van Horn and Sheriff Carpenter had arrived on the scene, the coroner William Larrick had already pronounced Homer dead and ordered his body be taken to the Dover Hospital for an autopsy. So the only witness we had was was Leela. So and she was not a good witness. I asked Van Horn what he thought about Homer running to the bell and how it was possible that a man with four stab wounds in his chest could make it that far. And additionally, why wouldn't he just go for the phone? Because in his mind, you know, he said he was really bleeding severely. So in his mind, you know, that's a way to get the attention of somebody. Out where they live, probably the closest person was a quarter of a mile away, at least an eighth of a mile away. So uh, the chance of somebody hearing the bell slim, you know, but that, in his mind, that's that's how he's going to get the attention. We, we had an artist go down and try to get her to uh, to tell us what the person looked like. I found the composite sketch in an old newspaper article that came out a few days after the murder and depicts a white male with a beard and shaggy brown hair, but it seemed that Leela didn't agree that that's what he even looked like. Yeah, so, uh, so then we'd show her the thing a day or so later. She said, well, that don't look like, don't look like the person. We'd say, well, Leela, that's what you said. That's, you know, so, uh, so she, she changed the description two or three times on us. Leela was probably the poorest witness that I could have had. Because she, she didn't, she, she kept changing the story and, and uh, not a good witness. 
In his book, he mentions that there were suspects and circumstantial evidence, but since it was an ongoing investigation, he had to be intentionally vague. He does mention that one day, all the evidence will fall into place and that these crimes will eventually be prosecuted. You know, it's, there wasn't much to say other than what the, the basics. Of course, I couldn't uh, say what I knew, you know, who my suspects was. I, you know, I, I didn't have nothing. To, as far as to, to prove anything in court, so uh, so when I retired, I now they did uh, the cold uh, the sheriff uh, after I retired, he sent four three or four deputies to uh, a cold case seminar and assigned each of them. And the Potts murders was. One of them, but uh, they couldn't get anything more than what I'd got way back when. So, uh, so it's still a cold case. But, uh, but uh, the the one detective that was working it is now the sheriff. But uh, you know he's busy being a sheriff. I asked Van Horn if he bought the theory that maybe Leela had something to do with Homer's murder, but he disagreed. Just a failed robbery. That uh, when uh, when Homer refused to give him any money that uh homer got stabbed and she got stabbed and he took off but they you know never got anything and once once he uh stabbed him he took off and he, he panicked and took off as i recall it was 20 months to the day later that uh where they broke in and stabbed her as i'm going from memory but i think 17 times that she was stabbed A few months ago, a comment appeared on Tapu's blog that questions Leela's story. The person who posted anonymously claims they were present at the crime scene the day of Homer's murder. They wrote that it was odd that a blood and tissue trail led from the bell to the side door as though he were attacked as he was trying to ring the bell. They also noted that he put up a fight and there was blood splatter present on the side of the house. This contradicts Leela's claim that he was attacked just inside the front door. Even the neighbor, Margaret Ramage, thought the attack happened by the back door. The anonymous writer also said they weren't present at the scene of Leela's murder 20 months later, but heard it involve the occult. This comment isn't the only source that doubted Leela's version of the events. I obtained a document compiled a week after Homer's death by a private investigator that found inconsistencies in Leela's story. It isn't an official investigation document, but it details concerns and questions that arose that the PI had during an informal conversation with Leela on March 7th, the same day she returned home for the first time since the incident. Leela claimed the attacker made this statement four times while he was stabbing Homer. Give me your money and I'll be on my way. The PI believed this was questionable and uncharacteristic of something a young man would say. Leela also said he took the knife with him in a matter-of-fact way, as if to make a point, without apparent emotion. The P.I. found it questionable that a husband would flee the area where his wife was being attacked to ring the bell. The P.I. also questioned if there was adequate room for Homer to move through the area where the attacker was to even get to the back door. And if so, why wasn't there blood in the living room area? Other inconsistencies included the way she described the intruder holding the knife, sometimes forward in his hand and other times backwards. She described the attacker as being a real murderer. He knew what he was doing. He jabbed in and up. The PI was concerned that nothing was stolen and that the attacker never went upstairs or even attempted to find money. During a discussion with Leela, she quoted the Bible, saying, Thou shalt not kill, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. God forgives, seventy times seven. Leela also described the intruder as bearded and neatly dressed. She almost seemed impressed by his attire, but couldn't describe what he was wearing. The PI returned to Leela's residence a few days later and found her in a distressed state. She said there were rumors that she killed Homer and that the sheriff's department was trying to trick her into taking a polygraph test. The PI speculated that the motive could have been over their will. It was reported that she had recently torn it up. Leela was said to be a foster child, and then her foster parents allegedly arranged her marriage with Homer in order to leave their estate to him. Supposedly, 
Leela had her mother sign a, a will leaving their estate to her under the pretense that it was insurance papers. It was also reported that she showed little or no emotion after returning to the house after her stay at the hospital. The PI then offers several theories as to what occurred that day. He speculated that an argument between Homer and Leela may have occurred at the front door and that Leela struck Homer with the ceramic praying hands. He theorized that Homer then exited the front door and went around to the bell to summon help. When he went back to the back porch, he was met by Leela and she stabbed him several times and then drug him back inside. He speculated that Leela then injured herself and called the neighbor for assistance. The evidence backing this claim was the large amount of blood present in the black porch area and the absence of blood throughout the rest of the house. Homer would have been bleeding badly, and if he moved through the house to get to the bell, as Leela claimed, there would have been blood all over. The stab wounds were also characteristic of a downward attack, and Leela repeatedly claimed the attacker used an upward motion. It also didn't add up that Homer would run past the telephone in the kitchen to get to the bell. This theory seems somewhat questionable since a local gun store owner, James Henthorne, reported to police that he saw a blue Chevy Nova parked in front of the house around 1 p.m. This would indicate that someone else was at the residence when Homer was killed. The PI offered another theory. He said the attacker may have inflicted a minor wound on Homer in the front porch area and then chased Homer to the back porch where a second person, either another intruder or Leela, locked the back door and then he was fatally wounded on the back porch. It's unclear exactly what happened to Homer that day, but one thing is evident. Leela's story didn't add up. Thanks for listening to episode one of Lords of Death. Episode two will be released in two weeks on October 15th. Music in this episode was contributed by M. Ross Perkins, George Miller, Zach Johnson, and Thrasher Banks. The song Habits contributed by Cutouts, along with their song Mantra. Artwork was contributed by Cody Gunningham. Additional thanks to Guernsey County Library for providing us with the archive news articles. If you have information relating to the case, please reach out to the team at Lords of Death at 937-985-3469 and leave us a voicemail. Or you can reach out to us on social media via Facebook or Twitter. Next time on Lords of Death. But she was uh, where she'd been stabbed several times. They wanted to tell me something, but they were very fearful because these crimes had not been solved. Mm -hmm. And they were right nearby. I don't care what the reason. I, it, I'm not asking you why. I'm asking you, did you hurt that old lady? I need an answer. And I, I need the fucking truth. And he looked in my eye and he told me the truth.